Niger, for example, the coup is overtly fueled by an anti-France sentiment. For France to have imposed sanctions on Niger since the coup, uh, which could push its more than 25 million people further into poverty. So is it a coup d'etat or is it actually decolonization? We see Western and Central African nations decolonizing from the French imperialism, from Western imperialism, and fighting for their independence away from colonial rule. They're still using the franc, calling it aid. My continent over here is pretty much fighting away from neocolonialism, and it's usually through contractual slavery, meaning like France, for example, whether it's Niger or Mali, Bonifacio, or any of the other current ECOWAS countries like Nigeria, Basically, they're using the CFA. Now, the CFA is tied to the euro, but that's not a good thing, right? It sounds like, yeah, it's good to have a strong currency, but not really. What happens is when they're doing trade around the world in the markets, what happens is you tend to have an expensive currency. And when you have an expensive currency that's strong, say it's linked to the euro, you tend not to export as much because essentially you're expensive when you have like a strong currency and you're doing exporting your goods and your products out inside of your country and you're forced to use an old neocolonialism type of currency like the cfa franc that's pegged to the euro when you're exporting your goods let's say rice right so let's say it's worth four of x and let's say another competitor competing country is offering the same good but it's at one x they're gonna go to the one next. They're not gonna to go to yours just because it's, you know, more expensive for the same good. So that's why it's not good to have the length. And so, with this being, you know, moving away from the French, you know, colonial, imperialistic powers and towards, you know, independence, that's just gonna be a struggle and a fight because, you know, you're trying to fight forces that have been occupying your country for a long time, to having great structures militarily, economically, politically. There's a lot of corruption, as you know. People are looking out for their own families, not for their own countries. French and foreign forces have been here for a while. Despite this, insecurity is still present. We have not taken power. Our country is free and independent, and we want them to leave our territory, a demonstrator said. A lot, a lot of these countries are pro-public countries, but to, because of democratic courses, they may gain property rights for many, and then that moves towards autocracy, right? So one thing you gotta worry about with neo-colonial powers is essentially when you're trying to decolonize and uh, you know influential media that has been present in your area for a long time by calling it coup, that basically gives it a de facto status that it's a true government when it's really not, right? It's an occupational force. Since the advent of the coup d'etat, they threaten us and we will answer their threats and we will do it until they leave our country a second protester at And so it's not really a coup because they were never there de jour style. They've only they've been there through de facto means, right? Meaning by force, right? And not really by right of uh, the people. That's one thing also to consider in the matter is whether it's actually the true government or whether it's just an occupational forces that are you know, trying to rewrite their own history into your country soil. So there's about 14 countries in Western and Central Africa that are still using the CFA. The CFA is still the biggest imperialistic tool used. You control the country's money. You basically control quite a bit of energy flow of human labor. When you can print your currency and you have to, you know, send it to another country and that's the only means that they use it, that is one of the worst ways to basically ball and chain that country into modern day slavery and contractual rights. Now, the slavery that is not end just there, it also continues on in these Western African countries that are colonized by Western forces, especially France, because of something called uh, the right of first refusal. Basically, any products and resources made by these uh, colon colonized governments have to be sent to uh, basically France first before any other country. And France has the right to say no to these imports or uh, to France or exports out of these African countries. And if they don't want it, then they're allowed. Not by option, but they're allowed. They're given permission as children are given permission by their parents to send these resources abroad to other countries. So France has another first right of refusal. 
Now, all of these factors also play into the fact that Africa cannot develop that way. So, you know, Africa can, has like many regions where you can grow grain and crops of all sorts of plant vegetation. And the reason they are not allowed to eat the road is because of these uh, right of first refusals, including domestically, meaning they have to offer the, you know, crops, the corns, the wheat, sugar cane, you know, you name it, uh, all the plants and vegetables, you know, all these resources to France first before their own people because of the neo-colonial uh, contracts that exist right now, plus the corruption of the leaders in those regions. Now we see leaders in Burna Faso, Mali in the past, and currently with, you know, hitting headlines being Niger, basically re revolutionizing and people are calling it the coup, even though it's just really the means of, these, of decolonization, <laughs> taking away imperial forces and having their own union structure. There will be chaotic, there will be a lot of uneasiness in the beginning, but that is the right of freedom, right? Rather than fake ball and chain that, you know, for your security, that's the constant freedom. Now, much of these colonial forces are being basically assisted by uh, forces that are called, called the enemies of the West, such as Russia and China. We see China donate. Well, actually, they didn't start off donating. They started loaning uh, quite a bit of money to projects in Africa to develop their infrastructure. You can check out that video to learn more about how China has influenced African nations. Uh, abroad, generally speaking, across Africa with infrastructure loans. But not only that, we also see Russia having an influence in those regions as well. Uh, with the Wagner Group, for example, providing military security for quite a bit of these countries. Now, uh, the Wagner Group has been there quite a bit of time, uh, you know, for many years. Russia has been a close partner to many of these African nations because they're providing uh, forces against the French forces to basically fight them off. And that has been happening for many years now. It's only capturing headlines today. But not only that, but basically once the French forces are removed, and they will be continuing to be removed, essentially Russia and China will continue to, you know, support African nations, whether it's through debt forgiveness programs or, you know, providing wheat and grain specifically for them. So it's a really interesting time because what happens is when uh, a lot of these countries basically are evicting the French forces, uh, it's quite a bit of difference rather than just basically having a slave, modern slavery with using, you know, the CFA colonial uh, uh, currency. The French have been asked to leave, but they refused. We are going to defeat those plotting against our country. We are going to defeat them and stomp them out. They are asking you to get ready. You mustn't sleep or doze off. They will leave. You know, Russia is not going to be forcing these African nations to use the ruble, right? Uh, not only that, they're not asking for the right of first refusal. So that alone is a huge impact because now they can, you know, these countries can basically create their own currency, uh, you know, and move forward by basically having, you know, more affordable currency to buy grain products or other products around the world because they're, they don't, they're not pegged to the euro like they currently are in France thus making it very expensive for them to basically compete on the market. So with French, French forces slowly be the way by the Wagner Group and Russian military assistance as well and some other uh, allied nations to the BRIC nations as well, slowly these African nations will find their decolonized footprint and eventually install their own republican form of government as that is the only one that can happen with an electoral system River voting system, or electoral system, all continue to grow their economies and hopefully prosper in the future. Another benefit, if they do continue to move away from the CFA and create their own currency, is affordable uh, labor, basically allowing history to repeat itself of what happened in China, where you had affordable labor because you had a cheap currency. If they continue to peg to the CFA or the euro, they'll be an expensive currency, and the labor is, the, although abundant and cheap there, it just it can't be purchase using uh, that means. So it's important to have a, an affordable currency and that way the labor can be paid for and you can basically multiply and bring the lower uh, spectrum of their society in Africa and these many CFA countries, the 14 that I mentioned earlier, into the middle class. Eventually, basically what happened with China. China is agrarian. Urbanizing fast, you betcha. 
but still agrarian. Most in terms of land, not population. Come on, Michael. No, <laughs> no, you're wrong about this. Now with Russian forces, you know, assisting many African nations alongside the debt forgiveness program that they've already done with the Russian Africa Summit 2023 that just completed in Johannesburg and the promise that, you know, they'll be able to support six disenfranchised nations with re with grain. That is a huge move. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of African countries now that are very favorable with me towards uh, Russia because of not only the current decolonization that's happening, but it's basically actually working as partners rather than as, um, you know, modern day slaveries, as you've heard. Basically, the before UK Prime Minister mentioned, you will not be able to access the modern slavery system and you will with not. Countries like Niger, or Paso, and Mali, you know, they have a lot of resources. They have like things like, you know, uranium for weapon development, military grade, quite high concentrations. They have, you know, phosphates for chemistries. Uh, they have, you know, many different types of organic seeds, you know, untarnished by GMO yet. So that's quite valuable. They have so much power to have all sorts of zincs and all sorts of metals. So the whole operation, there's a lot of resources that are coming out of these regions. And these regions are very resource rich, but you know, they're currency poor because of neocolonials and imperialism that are brought on by Western forces. And so with it not really being a coup, it's actually just called, you know, decolonization. It's not a coup because that gives credence to a de facto government when it's really a de jure government that's replaced it, right? So that has to be considered that. It is resource rich. It's gonna be moving away from, uh, you know, slowly over time with a lot of fight because a lot of these guys don't wanna lose those powers. Like the Franks don't wanna lose those powers. A lot of Albions don't wanna lose that power of control, of basically leeching and, you know, vampirically living off of other people's resources in far regions and just basically stepping on the neck of many of these countries as well. That's why we see France saying, hey, let's sanction these guys. I can't believe it. And hey, you know, I'm France and, you know, these African countries I have control over still will not be doing trade with these, you know, these guys that are basically rebelling against us. The National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland rejects these sanctions in their entirety and refuses to give in to any pressure from any quarter. We reject any interference in the internal affairs of Niger and reject the claim by some and others to punish the National Council for the safeguarding of the homeland and the people of Niger as an example. It's quite interesting seeing that power dynamic by African countries that are still, you know, kissing the feet of the French forces. We have to prepare for all eventualities and uh, excellencies you are here for the final eventuality, the last resort. That is planning for a possible to the Meanwhile, there's other African people, African countries that are saying, you know what, uh, we're done kissing your feet and we are going to be basically fighting for us. And those are saying basically neighbors of Africa sanctioning one another when it comes to trade, like we see in Niger and Nigeria. So basically France pulling its strings and Western forces pulling its strings because of the fear of sanctioning. And that is basically why it's important to have a BRICS currency and using Bitcoin if that BRICS currency isn't pegged by gold and it just remains like a basket of fiat, like we see with the SDRs, which is another whole other scam, right? It's basically elitist, just, you know, ingraining their forces and their strength across the globe. And we don't want that. We basically want kind of currency that is backed by gold, right? That way it doesn't just stay as currency, it actually becomes money. And if that doesn't happen, then we need something that's more sound, like Bitcoin, for example, that has a max supply that cannot be printed, that has a verifiable, trackable history, a proof of work. You know, it's like a battery capacitor, where the more you solve this puzzle, the stronger, basically, the network effect gets, hence creating a firewall along with a Bitcoin. So that's how the currency money dynamic is actually playing. And it all stems to the reason that's why basically Niger, Bonifacio, Mali have basically moved away from imperialistic French forces and starting to decolonize. And it will be a struggle. It won't be easy. It'll probably be quite a bit of process, but that's the basically price of freedom. The government has already denounced the agreements which allowed them to be on our territory. They are in an illegal position 
and I think that the exchanges that are underway should very quickly allow these forces to withdraw from our country. Regarding the ambassador, I think there is nothing to do. He did not have adequate behavior. As a diplomat, I asked at one time to preserve relations between the states. France is a country with which we had always developed relations of cooperation. In this context, I asked the Minister of Foreign Affairs here to send an official message to invite him to come, discuss with us and see to what extent we could proceed, let's say, to a settlement, a de-escalation, as they say. He refused to do so. On the opposite, he has a behavior of contempt, and that is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. And if people don't like freedom and they want to be lullabied into a false sense of security, and they want to continue to be disenfranchised and wonder, oh, you know, they just want to complain about the system and the man and all that stuff. Without the French intervention, if our troops had not died in action in Africa, if the Sava and Barkan operations had not been launched, today we wouldn't be talking about Mali, Burkina Faso or Niger. Those states would no longer exist. As French President Macron thinks of lies like Papilla Pew, French ally Italy calls them out on their fib. Italian Foreign Minister Di Moai says, and I quote, if France didn't have its African colonies, because that's what they should be called, it would be the 15th largest world economy. Instead, it's amongst the first exactly because of what it's doing in Africa. End of quote. Even the former French president, Francois Maternaf, is aware of Macron's lies. And I quote, Without Africa, France will have no history in the 21st century. End of quote. And you're not willing to fight? Well then, I guess, uh, you're not, you, you don't have the spirit of the, uh, you know, the European founding fathers when they came to America under the uh, protection of Sultan Mohammed of uh, Morocco back where America was called Morocco and not the North Africa Morocco that was given independence by France to basically reconstruct history. And having said all that, you know, with the resource rich, you know, currency poor, with the corruption that basically entails and the contractual obligation of the right of first refusal and many other French uh, contractual agreements that exist in a lot of these Francophone African nations. Another one being, for example, for the military, for the military training for many of these African countries, they actually have to send them to France to get a specific type of training before they can go back to their country and uh, continue to work in those countries as well, which is very weird. Like, why are you sending your people to be trained in France so they can get indoctrinated and then they return to their own country to, you know, perform services, but I guess who's back in the bell, you know what I mean? It's the Pied Piper, you know, and then eventually who's paying that too? You no, know, you have to pay for that, right? So uh, there's just a whole lot of weird imperialistic contracts that still exist today across Africa, uh, whether it's, you know, the military thing or the money, the currency issue for the, you know, right of first refusal for resources and, you know, exports. The, the whole thing's a hot mess, right? And they just wonder, oh, why aren't African people just getting together and uniting? It's because of these colonial contracts, right? And if that doesn't happen, you have forces like NATO and France and the UK and the US basically coming in and creating, you know, disasters. They hate these guys have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, advanced technology that can definitely disrupt the major economies. You know, there's uh, a book you guys can read also called The Shock Doctrine. Uh, that's actually, uh, it shows you basically how military uh testing can be enforced into the economy right i like shockwave testing and whatnot there's also like you know economic hitman where it talks about like you know professionals going into a country trying to destabilize and there's different tiers of the leading up to military invasion like we saw in iraq with the brics nations basically assisting quite a bit with the decolonizing aspect of africa it sounds so promising I'm so excited to check that stuff out. So as all that unfolds, let me know down below your thoughts. Thanks again for watching the Financial Almanac, and I'll see you guys in this next video.